In this video, we will have a look at caching support in Spring Boot, how to configure it and use it to cache objects, update cache and remove objects from cache. Suppose you have a web application that manages articles. You get HTTP requests to save articles, update articles, fetch articles and delete them. These articles are stored in a database. Now, each time a request to fetch an article arrives, the application looks over the database and fetches it. If there are multiple requests to fetch the same article, then it does not make any sense to fetch it from database again and again. Multiple access to database also makes the application slower. A solution to this problem is caching. Caching means storing objects or data in a separate area. This area is called cache. Cache can be an in-memory database or a memory location or a server depending on the implementation. With caching enabled, the application first looks for the required object in the cache instead of fetching it from the database or actual data store. If it cannot find the object in cache, only then it accesses the database and once it is fetched, it places it inside the cache for future accesses. Caching is used to make the data access faster since the object or data is fetched from the database only the first time when it is required. Subsequently, it is fetched from the cache and the database is not accessed. Thus, caching improves the performance of an application. Spring Boot provides support for caching using its starter cache dependencies. You can use any of the external cache providers to cache objects. These are the cache providers supported by Spring Boot caching. If Spring Boot does not detect any of the cache providers, then it uses concurrent hash map to store data. Using the default cache provider is not recommended for production, but it is fine to understand Spring Boot caching and we will be doing that in this video. Separate configuration is required if any of these cache providers is used. This video will only cover default Spring Boot caching support. In the first section of the video, we will create a basic REST application with three endpoints from scratch. In the second section, we will learn how to and why to add caching support to it. If you have not yet subscribed to the channel, then do it right away to stay updated. Open Spring Tools to it. Create a new Spring project. Go to File, New, Project and search for Spring Starter Project. Select Gradle as the build tool. You can also choose Maven. Packaging as JAR, Java version 17, Fill in the details such as artifact, version, description, and package. Click next. Select Spring Boot version and select web and cache dependencies. Click finish. You can also do this using Spring Initializer. There are many videos where I've explained how to create a Spring REST application from scratch. Link of one such video is at the top right corner. The project is generated along with the main class. Go to projects build.gradle file. Look, here is a dependency for Spring Boot starter cache. Now let's go ahead and create REST API endpoints for an article application to fetch, update and delete an article. First create an article class, which will be the domain object. Simply add an ID field. Next, create a service class. Annotate it with service annotation. Add a method to fetch an article by its ID. This method should accept article ID as argument. In this video, we will simply print a message and not write the business logic for any of the methods since its aim is to show how caching works. Next, create a method to update an article. This method will accept an object of type article. Again, print a message here. Finally, define a method to delete an article. This will also accept article ID as argument. Next, we will define endpoints for each of these methods. Create a new controller class. Add REST controller annotation to make it a Spring controller. Also provide a root URL for all methods of this class using the request mapping annotation. Auto add an object of service class so that its object becomes available here. Create a method to fetch article. This will accept an integer argument. Its method will be HTTP get. So add get mapping annotation over it along with a variable 
so that we can accept article ID directly from URL. Value of this variable will be populated from this URL parameter. So, provide path variable annotation before it. This variable in path variable annotation and the parameter in get mapping should match. You can learn path variable annotation in detail following the video whose link is at the top right corner. Call service method. Next, create a method to update an article. This method should accept article object as argument and should have request body annotation. Add a put mapping annotation over this method since this will be an HTTP put method. Call corresponding service method to update article. Finally, define a method to delete an article. This will also accept article ID as argument and its value will be fetched from URL. So, add path variable annotation similar to what we did in fetch article method. Since this will be an HTTP delete method, method annotation will be delete mapping along with variable to access article ID. Run the main class. The application is running at port 8080. Go to postman and access method to get an article by its ID. Its URL will be localhost colon 8080 slash article slash ID. Let's say one. Method will be get. Send. Here is the message printed. So, our REST application is working fine. Now let's see how to add caching support into this application and what benefit will it provide. Let's access this URL multiple times. You see, every time we try to fetch an article, it will execute the logic written here to fetch an article. It might be fetching it from a database or another HTTP call, whatever it is, but requires some resources impacting overall application performance. A better approach would be that once we fetch a particular record, it should store it somewhere and then return the same record for subsequent request. That's exactly what we are going to do next using Spring Boot Caching. There are a handful of annotations that you need to understand to add caching support to Spring Boot applications. This annotation is used to inform Spring Boot that we want to use caching in this application. This annotation may be applied over Spring Boot main class. So, go to the main class and add this annotation. It can also be applied over a Spring Configuration class. If you are using the default cache manager and you do not want to customize it, then there is no need to create a separate class to apply enable caching annotation. After we have informed Spring that we need to support caching, we need to tell what object we want to cache. This is done by using cacheable annotation. This annotation is applied over a method whose result we want to store in cache and the return value of that method is automatically cached by Spring. So, in our case, we have to apply this over the method that fetches an article. With Cacheable, we also need to provide the name of Cache where Spring would store objects and look for them for retrieval. You can provide multiple Cache names as an array as well. When a request to fetch an article arrives, Spring Boot will look for it in the Cache named articles. If the article is found in Cache, then this method will not be invoked and if not, this method will be called and it will fetch the object as per the logic defined here. This also means that for the first time, this method will be invoked since the article would not be present in the cache. Name of the cache is mandatory as the application will fail at runtime with the Java illegal state exception. All the objects are cached according to a key. If no key is specified, then the method parameters are used to create a key. So, in this case, article ID will be the key against which an article will be cached. This is similar to a key in HashMap. You can have full control over cache behavior such as storing objects based on a condition or storing only fixed number of results for this method, etc. This becomes a bit advanced. If you would also like to learn these and it will be covered in the coming video on the same topic. Cacheable can also be applied over a class. In this case, it adds caching behavior to all the methods of this class and the return values from all the methods are cached. Cached objects are the copies of original objects and should be identical to them. When original object changes, then cached object should also be updated. This is done using cache put annotation and is applied over a method that performs update operation. So, in our application, it should be applied over the method that is updating the article. Again, we have to provide the name of cache where it will be updating the objects. 
This annotation is used to indicate a remove operation of the data from cache and is applied on the method that deletes object. So, here it will be applied over the method that deletes object along with the name of cache. Now, let's understand the behavior of these annotations. We start the application. Back to Postman again. Send the request to fetch article. Send it multiple times again. Back to application. Look, only one message is printed which means that it fetched the article only once. For subsequent request, this method was not even called. Change the ID of article. Send. Message is printed for article ID 2. Again send the request. The method is not called which means that the result was cached. Next send an update request. Change the URL. Add a request body. Select body, raw and then JSON. Provide a JSON object with ID. Change the method to put and send. The object is updated. Now let's test delete method. Provide the article ID in URL parameter. Change the method to delete. Send the request. The object is deleted. Now, if I resend the get request to fetch an article, what should happen? Will the fetch article be called or not? Pause the video and think. Write the answer in the comment section below and check if you guessed it right. The method will be called since we removed the object from cache and when it tries to search in the cache, it won't find and call the actual fetch logic. That is all for this video. In the coming video, we will explore more advanced options such as configuring cache at one place, caching objects conditionally using unless, expiring cache, etc. See you there.